Hey everyone, this is Pete Atkins, writer of Hellraiser 2, Hellraiser 3, and Hellraiser 4. And speaking of Hellraiser 4, why don't you enjoy this fun fan commentary by composer Lito Velasco and radio of horror host Chris on Film Dungeon Commentary. Cheers. Welcome to another exciting episode of Film Dungeon Commentary, part of the Radio of Horror Network. I am your host once again, Dr. Chris, and joining me for this episode of Hellraiser Bloodlines, we have the composer of the Leviathan documentary, which is all about Hellraiser, Lito Velasco. Take a bow. Thank you. I appreciate that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. A pleasure to be discussing this film with you. Lito and I have had different opinions about this movie, but we can both agree that the book that came out with the original script is the better version. Also because I had Peter Atkins on my show, and that will be a video that you can watch on the Radio Horror YouTube channel alongside this one very, 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 very soon. Otherwise, go to wdcuw.org to listen to it now, as it is still streaming up on their website. Uh, but Peter was a delight to have on the show, and if you think he was unpacking 25 years' worth of secrets for us about the movie, he really wasn't, because he didn't remember a lot. And most of what he was going to be was, F the Weinsteins, and F the Weinsteins, and F this, that, and the other thing. But uh, we decided not to do that, because there's been enough of F the Weinsteins to be blue in the face about. I don't need to rehash it on my own show. Uh, but it was just more about like you know things that he didn't like, and then things about the book, and then the history about like the original script and how it became a book. Because it's not a novel; it's the original script. For people who are not understanding, it is not a novelization; it is the actual original script. So just keep that in mind if you do pick up the Hellraiser Bloodlines original script. Um, that company puts out a lot of great movie adaptations. So. Yeah, it was cool to read, for sure. It is definitely cool to read. I have my copy right here as well. And there's no other version of this movie that's not on Blu-ray or DVD. It's the same film throughout, and on streaming as well. There's no... We're not watching a collector's edition. Like, 1 and 2 might have a few extra things here and there. But honestly, I think all the releases of Hellraiser are pretty much the same. So, we're going to start our film with the Dimension logo coming up on the screen. If you wish to play your film alongside us talking about it, that is totally fine. Otherwise, you don't have to because we're basically going to be doing a big, like, oh, so this was in the uh, the original script and this didn't happen in the movie, which Lito has written a bunch of stuff down about. So, <laughs> yeah, and, cliff notes. Cliff notes. And then we'll also be talking about, you know, uh, Parks and Rec and things like that, too. <laughs> <laughs> sure. How do you go from this to Parks and Rec? Who knows? How do you go from Halloween to Ant? How do you go from Halloween to Ant Man? <laughs> Good agents, I guess. I mean, seriously, uh, Paul Rudd's got a great career. So, and so does uh, yep. so does Scott. So, <laughs> yep. Yep. but uh, like I said, uh, start uh, hitting play when I count down one, two, three, and the Dimension logo will be crazily crawling into the screen zero 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 one on your DVD or Blu-ray or streaming. Now, one, two, three, go. Oh, Dimension. If, the uh, classic logo. It's the greatest, honestly, logo you want to see before a horror movie, like you want to see 20th Century Fox before a, uh, a Star Wars movie. Yeah, yeah, For, especially in this era. Right, right. And we, for some dumb reason, got a flash of Pinhead. I, I guarantee that was not in the original script because it's not in the original script. <laughs> no, no, that's, that seems like another studio mandate. They're all over this film. That's for sure. Now, Bruce Ramsey, Valentina Vargas. Uh, who is Bruce Ramsey? Do you know? I'm assuming he's the main character. I thought, yes, I mean the, 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 the Marchand and the John Merchant and Paul Merchant and all those people. <laughs> and, uh, Valentina Vargas is, uh, the, the, the demon princess Angelique, correct? Yes. Oh, yeah, my gosh, for sure. So beautiful in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. Her when I was reading the script and, and comparing it to the film, it's odd that they made the choice that they made to introduce her the way they did in the film because it's like she's just kind of this popper, you know, that they bring in off the streets. And I guess it it makes her disappearance, you know, kind of sinister it's like oh they just took this poor girl and turned her into this demon and et cetera, et cetera. but I, I actually really prefer the way she's introduced in the script that she's you know beginning her path as a pre-existing demon from hell or just it seemed to make so much more sense because in the film version it's like she it completely takes away her mm -hmm. motivation it just reduces her to like a spectator that's forced to be this thing and it's it doesn't make any sense it's like why did you do this like why i 
Anyway, the, the film was littered with choices like that that just seemed to make no sense at all. But right. I'm guessing that's the studio's interference. There's Alan Smithy, that guy. Yeah. He's directed some of the most famous pieces of crap in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that guy anyway? We need to interview him. I got to also point out, I believe, um, and this is, I mean, we'll, we'll be waxing Vargas throughout this entire film, but uh, isn't she the only woman that appears in the name of the Rose? <laughs> is she? Yeah, because that's sure. all about monks. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. That's, uh, that's uh, you know, that's um, Sean Connery's, uh, you know, uh, you know his, his film with... Um, Oh crap! I forgot. Is it Christian Slater? Yeah, Christian, very young Christian Slater, Ron Perlman, yeah. F.W. Murnau. Yeah. yeah, yeah, she is like the only woman on the cast list. The girl, she's the girl. That's right. I forgot about that. Okay, so this is the first use of virtual reality, or yeah. something. Um, uh, uh, oh God, there, there's some bad CGI. C CGI, questionable CGI that we're getting. But... Very video game CGI. If you ever played Wing yeah. Commander at the time, Wing Commander with uh, Mark Hamill and John Reese Davis and Malcolm McDowell, yeah. and Biff from Back to the yeah. Future. <laughs> it's uh, it's I do like some of the things that made it to the film I'm that sorry. were in the script. I I really like such as the robot, the way the robots pose is identical to that of uh, Frank in the first film and Elliot Spencer in the second film. And the script actually mentioned that. Right. Like it spells it out, and which this, I thought was really cool. This robot I always thought was the Terminator's redhead, redheaded stepbrother. <laughs> <laughs> He's a cross between Terminator and Johnny from uh, uh, Short Circuit, Johnny 5-0 or whatever his name was. Right. Lito, keep talking. I just got to, I just got to click one little button real quick. I'll be right back. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, real quick to get this out of the way as we start this film, just for anybody that's listening, I wanted to mention because it's something that I thought a lot about when I was watching it and something I think about when I watch any Hellraiser film. It's the Hellraiser movie, the original film, and the sort of core story that, you know, drives the Cenobites and kind of gives them their purpose is it's always been about longing and desperate love and loss. And, you know, usually these things are kind of secretive in and of themselves within the, the construct of the story. So it's like, it feels like it's such a necessary component for Hellraiser, which is why I think that three doesn't quite work as well as the first two films, even though I really enjoy that movie. I think, but three, like, I think three doesn't work. And this was said very well at a Clive Barker panel. I was at yesterday at Necronomicon in Providence, Rhode yeah. Island is because mm -hmm. when you start introducing camera head man as a Cenobite, that is when you have lost it. <laughs> Right. And it's also, I think it doesn't, you know, the kind of desperation and longing and loss that's at the center three is different because it's about this girl's, you know, Joey's loss of her father. That's a totally different longing than what drives the first two films and even bloodlines. It's kind of this like forbidden love that, you know, you can't have and, you know, you shouldn't have because this film definitely has that at its core. You know, Angelique and Le Marchand definitely have this something that goes beyond the generations that even though he knows he shouldn't be lusting after her, he wants her. And it's, and, and I think it even goes beyond the Cenobites themselves. It's, there's something between these two characters that connects them in a way that reminds me so much of the first film. It's, it's a shame that we didn't get more of the script itself because the, the script really fleshes that out even more so. Yeah. And there's none of this in the beginning of the script. It's all in the French nope. past and the entire yep. start of the script is the French past. And yeah. Peter said that um, this was written literally over a weekend with Clive while they were getting drunk. Um, and then when they went to test audiences, the first reaction on the test card, because you write out these little cards. I don't know if you've ever seen a test card before. Yeah. was where's Pinhead in the beginning of the movie. Yeah, I mean, and that's funny because we discussed that a little bit before we started recording this over the past week, and it's like, I know the script was altered to include more Pinhead kind of as a reactionary choice by the studios because of the popularity of villains in this era, mm -hmm. but like these films don't need more Pinhead. What they need is, like I said, they need a story that's fueled by all of those hallmarks that I mentioned before, you know, longing and loss and love and secret desperation. And like, it's a shame because the original script has so much more of that stuff in it and so much less pinhead. And it's, it, if they could have filmed what they, what he wrote and 
been allowed to do it the way they wanted to, I think this film would have stood easily as the second best sequel, like, like almost head and shoulders with uh, Hellbound, honestly, if it had been filmed the way that it was written. The uh, woman interrogating our um, main hero throughout time, um, which, mm-hmm. which actress is this? Um, do you know who she's from? Because I've got a good joke lined up about what she's a I do not, cheap actually. version of. I, I, she's very familiar, but I, I couldn't place her. Hold on. Okay, hold on one second. I, don't, I didn't funny. have the uh, IMDb up. Just I like his I like his uh his bald cap the way it's lit like you can see the seam on his forehead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm being hypercritical of the makeup. Uh, this a- is this is all right. Where the hell is the cast list? Um, uh, uh, Kristen Harnos. She's Rimmer. Okay. Not a great right. not a great choice of words for a name for an actress but uh she reminds me of the actress that was in deep blue sea and and wing commander the movie saffron burrows hmm. oh she also reminds me a little bit of the girl that's currently playing ahsoka on in the star wars series oh Rosie, right uh, and kip Meyer, and kip myers really feels like a cheaper version like and i mean i don't mean cheap in like a derogatory way of a woman i mean cheap in like paying for somebody um <laughs> uh Merle Street. You know, but so when i say a cheaper version of an actress i don't mean anything derogatory it's not about like the man or the woman or them being like a cheap floozy right, i'm talking about right, cheap right. in paying them and yes i, I know she's of course in a very famous movie Lito and I just got done talking about before we started recording. She's in Nightmare Part 2, but yeah. I always thought that she was the cheaper Laura Dern. <laughs> oh, interesting. She always reminded me so much of Meryl Streep. A little bit, a little bit. But honestly, yeah. when she's really emotional and like yelling at Pinhead when Pinhead's got her kid later in the movie, it, it mm-hmm. really reminds me of Laura Dern when she's like, you know, struggling with the Velociraptors and screaming, you know, yeah. she can't get the gun. And yeah. later yeah. on, when she's getting a little emotional at, um, uh, 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 God damn it, um, uh, Oscar Isaac's it's character in The Last Jedi, what's his name? Poe Dameron. Poe Dameron, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Laura Dern has How the same kind of like stern attitude versus, you know, velociraptors and pilots that won't listen. <laughs> I love in this in the scene between Le Marchand and his wife, the way she asks him, is that it? It's like he spent all this time. I know. She's like, hours. it doesn't really do anything. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, oh like, my God, you're such a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm sorry, but can you create something as intricate looking <laughs> as what he just did? Exactly. I, I'm what sorry. Do do it? This is what's putting food on the table, lady. I mean, it doesn't really, it doesn't really do anything, does it? I'm like, oh my show, god. Show a little gratitude. I was always so offended by that, and I'm not a toy maker. I'm a writer. It's like, wow. It's interesting. A lot of the a lot of the dialogue in this scene where he talks about, you know, my son will be born into a better place than this, and et cetera, et cetera. A lot of that is taken straight from the script. It's just. Right. They totally rearranged where it went. You oh. know, it made so much more sense in the script. <laughs> All right, let let let's not lose let, let's not lose this scene right now, right here in the script. And you you took mm-hmm. a lot of notes. Isn't there like a bunch of people at a dinner party? Yeah, it's it's insane because the script itself talks about there's like eight different men that are gathered in a room, and Angelique is already in this room existing in her commanding princess of hell form. Okay. They, oh, by the way, this guy always been... creeped me out, by the way, the, uh, the, the, the rich French guy, he just, I, I just yeah, I, I hated this guy. <laughs> yeah. He's awful. Uh, but go on, go on. Yeah. So there's, there's a dinner party happening. Honestly, when I read the script, do you know what trailer I just got done watching? Mm-mm. The invitation. Oh, interesting. Which is a vampire movie, and it's not a spoiler, by the way. You watch the trailer for that movie, you're like, oh, they're vampires. I can see the fangs in their mouth. <laughs> right, yeah. And, oh, Harker? Gee, who could that be? <laughs> yeah. But I, I was watching, I, I just got done reading the script, and then I watched the trailer for The Invitation. What movie did I go see? I think I went to see Nope. Yeah, that's what it was. I saw Nope, and they played The Invitation <laughs> before it. And I was like... Hey, look. Somebody, Vampires. somebody read the Bloodline script. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's this scene. I mean, like I said, this scene when you compare it to what 
this script lays out, this scene just feels like it was an emergency truncation. Like they literally were like, look, we have to cut this scene down because we don't have the budget for right. extra actors and this mechanism that comes down from the top of the room. And it just feels like such a cheapened, almost like, I, I don't know. It's almost like unnecessary the way that they play this out with like tying her to the chair and all of her. Oh, <laughs> this is a, uh, this is a typical Saturday night for uh, my co-host, Mr. Zeneca. Go tune into the dead TV podcast to explain that joke. <laughs> and we make it all the time on the show. I am not spreading lies people. I'm just saying <laughs> <laughs> whenever yeah, something kinky monster. happens, whenever something kinky happens in a TV show that we're watching, I'm like, Mr. Zeneca mansplain to the audience what this is about. And she's like, Oh, well I will. And she goes on about BDSM and, sadomasochism <laughs> oh, there, well there you go <laughs> and this is exactly what this is I mean this is like a oh this is gross this is gross um, this is like literally what you pay people to do to you <laughs> man I, I'll take a hard pass on that when I was watching Parks and Rec and I see um, Scott Adam Scott from Parks and Rec do this I was like just waiting for him to like bust out some Hellraiser stuff sometime <laughs> on that show and it never never once He's a sci-fi nerd, so he's into Star Trek, but they never bust out the references to Hellraiser, and I'm like, damn it! Missed Such opportunity! <laughs> it's, and this scene here, it's uh, in the script, La Marchande is actually invited into the house um, by Delisle, and it's like, it's such a great way in the script to demonstrate the, the kind of... Um, the beginning of the connection between La Marchand and Angelique because right. he, he's oh, God, asked that in hair. the house and, Jesus Christ. and he meets her and it's like it's it's there's an obvious chemistry right from the start. It's also it's such a good way to show the the class system that was at play at this point in time in history. It's you know Peter did such a good job peppering the script with references to art and history and classism and all of these things that are important to this to each of the you know generations and it's like they just completely excised all of that stuff which is it's a real shame do you know what do you know where adam scott got his first start in by the way uh no i do not a halloween episode of er full moon saturday night and he was the bully griff griffin on uh, boy meets world oh wow we had no idea yeah um what's also funny do you know what his cur- do you know what he has just been cast in to play the dumbest goddamn fucking role ever. He is going to play Benjamin Parker on in the Madam Web movie that is not going to have Spider-Man in it. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I heard about that. Like, I what the like, fuck? Okay. And I also heard they cast Emma Roberts as Madam Web. Which... Well, th- the reason why is because they're going to be going and doing the Julia... Julia Julia, uh, the young Spider Woman who becomes Madame Web storyline, right. where the old right. Madame Web is killed for some reason. By the way, Madame Web in the comics, the original, is killed by uh, Craven the Hunter, who's also getting his own movie. Uh, but uh, I, I, I would love all of the absolute horror, body horror stuff that is included in that kind of story that I'm talking about, like we are seeing here on screen. Uh, but we won't get it because it's Sony and Disney and Spider-Man. Uh, but right. Uh, this right here with the uh, the skin and everything, it's just, uh, yeah, I've touched fake skin before. And it is mm-hmm. as it's disgusting gross. as you think it is. And by the way, fake skin, I'm talking like uh, used in skin grafts. I'm talking about skins that's used to help people who have horrible burns. I'm not talking about like latex like is in this movie. It is it is gross. Right. I I was uh, I went to a uh, I went to a hospital. It was a tour, and I got to see what like I'm like oh what's this? And I'm like oh this is uh, like what we use to help burn victims and stuff. And I was like Ooh, oh interesting. Gross. This scene at, in the film, the, this is a complete addition. All of this, the, the the operation and them taking her skin off, and and it it really bothered me after I read the script because it felt. Honestly, it felt unnecessary. It felt like gore for gore's sake. Uh-huh. And just like they wanted to get to more Hellraiser-esque imagery faster. Uh-huh. But it totally, again, it just completely robs Angelique of a more interesting character arc, which it's like, we got to get the gore in, but who cares about giving her a good story? It's like, well, okay, it, I guess. 
I did a, um, I didn't contact anybody about it, but I, I did a dumb thing on my radio show a few weeks ago when uh, Peter came on the show, before he came on the show, the week before he came on the show, I said, um, I said, I'm going to have, I want to have uh, Adam, uh, sorry, Daniel Litched on the show. He is the composer for this movie, uh, not uh, knowing he had passed away. <laughs> he passed away. Yeah. You know what? It's, that's a really good segue. I, I want to be sure I mention this and I don't forget. Um, the thing that this film, I think, excels in is getting back to what the Hellraiser scores, I think, should be and what they should mean. And what I mean by that is, even though I love Randy Miller's work on Hell on Earth, it's a very different sort of score when you compare it to the first two and then this score. It's This score really evokes all of those things that I was talking about earlier in a way that Chris's also did because Chris's score completely communicates the essence of Hellraiser and what it should be. He actually, I just saw him at a, at a panel at Midsummer Screen in Long Beach uh, at the beginning of August, end of July. And he said that his favorite track from the first Hellraiser is Hellbound Heart because it has a brief statement of the theme at the beginning, but then it gets into that kind of music that that accompanies Julia's memories of Frank and her pain and her desperation and all this stuff. And like these films need to be defined by their scores just as much as they do by their visuals. And like Daniel Lick absolutely nailed it. When I met him in Burbank years ago, I told him, I was like, dude, I know you're known for all of these credits, but your score for Bloodline was Oh, right so there. By the way, foreshadow- uh, hold on. Foreshadowing the mirror image that we just saw, that is what she's going to look like when she becomes a Cenobite. Yeah. 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 Just quick foreshadowing. Yeah. Sorry, go on. Yeah. No, good eye. No, it's just, I think that's one thing that this film does so well that I, I wonder if a lot of people even notice it because, you know, some people notice music and films, some don't. But Daniel, I mean... He was a composer a of Dexter. I mean... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he's, and uh, Boston Legal, if I'm not mistaken, for many right. years. He's, yeah. just, he's really good. Species? He was, well, he was really good. As well as Species? Yeah, yeah. That is this a, guy, uh, that is a, uh, that is a bucket list get for me to get Natasha Hendridge on my show. This is a missed opportunity right hell, right here. When, when a ghost opens the, ch- the, the corpse's chest cavity, why doesn't it? happen when he's saying open the gates of hell it's little things like that that like you're like why did you guys miss that like it's it's right there in front of you how could you not line that up that way and doesn't don't the walls look like the lamont configuration yes so much dude every time i see this scene i'm like well that's a that's a cute little nod and there is a great connection to the fact that i brought this up with peter saying you set up what's in the original script right here this thing the drawing in the mm-hmm. third Hellraiser movie, with the um, the, the the building at the very end of the movie, you know, with, yep. uh, designed like the lot, you set up Hellraiser four, yep. and he's like, yep. yeah, there was supposed to be an entire segue. It was exactly that. I don't remember how in two does Pinhead get trapped in a in a, in a, a statue, pillar. a pillar from two yeah. into three. That. That's disconnected for me, but I don't 100% remember. Also, by the way, why is Hellraiser 3 the only one that ever got a comic book adaptation? Uh, because bad choices. <laughs> why is Hellraiser 3 the only movie that ever gets marketed for toys? Remember how because, much Hellraiser 3 well, merchandise is out there with the Hellraiser 3 Hell on Earth logo on it? Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's crazy. I have a few of those items. Yeah. And, and now, and now, no, not everything, but for a while, yeah. Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth, into the 2000s, into the 2010s, you kept seeing. Nowadays, no. I can go to Target and see a a pinhead toy and just says Hellraiser. Um, Who owns the marketing for Hellraiser? Disney. Yeah, I know. Let's get in touch with them. (laughs) Yeah, Disney. Because they're making the – Hulu is making the Hellraiser movie. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Hulu's making the Hellraiser movie. They made the Prey movie. They made the the Books of Blood series – and they're doing the Alien TV show. So I'm hoping that we're going to... And they already announced that it is going to be rated R for sexual... Ooh, okay, we got our sex scene right here. Uh, sexual <laughs> content, violence, disturbing images, all the stuff you want from a Hellraiser, it's rated R, mm-hmm. which means they're... Obviously, awesome. Disney is not... The House of Mouse and all the cookie-cutter kitty stuff is not touching this uh, 
you know, movie starring the transgender actress from Sense8 as the Hell Priest. They did not say she's playing Pinhead. They said she's playing the Hell Priest. Well, I mean, again, kind of goes along with the original book. Yes, um, which was a, which you know, Pinhead was the background Cenobite. He was it was a female Cenobite that was the lead Cenobite or a androgynously um, genderless, feminine-looking yeah. creature, as you want to describe it. Uh, yeah, I was going to say it, it seemed to be a gender fluid creature in the original book. Right. By the way, we but you want to sell uh, you want to sell hot sexy statues. You basically put tits on it. <laughs> so we haven't even mentioned yet uh, in the in the script in the screenplay there in this French uh, oh, this segment. Oh, wig is terrible. The, there's a derelict character that's um, you know seen two or three times in the yes. opening, and I always envisioned that as being the exact same derelict as the first film. I would I would love to ask Peter like. Is that what that's supposed to be? It because is. like, that's who I saw it every is. time I read it. He okay, did say good. it is. He did say it is. Uh, yeah. Okay, so the, here here is where our argument happened on Facebook, and th- when I this is the very first Hellraiser movie I ever saw in my entire life. I have seen images mm-hmm. of Pinhead, but as a child, scared. The, oh, I love her eyes. Uh, scared the hell yeah. out of me. Um, and the reason why is because. Uh, Pinhead scared the crap out of me. I didn't quite understand it, and my sexuality was just blossoming when I was 15 years old when I first saw this movie. So I didn't understand anything about Pinhead or Hellraiser. And this was playing at the local theater, and as the local private school in the town of Waynesboro, Virginia, you could go see any movie you wanted. I saw Showgirls probably three times in cinema when I wasn't supposed to be. (laughs) I'm sorry to hear that. (laughs) And I saw Hellraiser in theaters. So I went into this going... I remember there are being a girl who fights Pinhead. Where's the girl who fights Pinhead? Like, Christy. And I'm like, where is she in this movie? Having not even th- thought about three. I'm mm-hmm. like, they jump over Christy's entire plot line to get back to the ending of Hellraiser 3. That was so jarring to me. Because I'm like, I, so does Christy's story fit like in between the French and the, uh, the modern day? Yes, I, for sure, because the building as it exists in modern day looks like the one at the end of Hellraiser 3. So it, I feel like she's in between those things. It really feels like Christie's story is a cast-off and not important to this plot line with the Lamont configuration, its origin. Right, but, but the thing is, it, the film explains it in a way that makes so much less than the screenplay. Like, if, if they would have adhered to the screenplay as it was written – it would have given more import. It would have given more like of this, why these characters are connected because it, before La Marchand is killed, there's that great scene where he's hypnotized Lar- by Mar- Angela. La Marchand. That's the, right. Yes. That's how you pronounce yeah, it. Yeah. La Marchand. Um, but okay. it is called and, the Lamont configuration though. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Okay. La- yeah. Sorry. I got my words. confused. No, 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 no. Watching. You're, you're saying the word correctly, but the box is called the Lamont configuration. Right. Okay. Gotcha. There is there is two okay. different words. Larma is the is the uh, the name the last name of the ancestor. Lamont right. configuration is just a shorter, more English version, I guess, of saying Larma Shand. Right. Uh, By the way, this whole scene it, in blue, this is awesome. I love this whole thing in blue, with the contrast with the blood. Yes. It pops. Yes. Um, I'm also so sorry that this actress keeps getting cast in roles where she has to be the heavy for damaged. Uh, uh, dam- dam- damaged children. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's face it. That's... She's got. You can look at her IMDb. There's three movies. This one, Nightmare, and I forget what the other one is. I gotta pull up her IMDb again. But she is the heavy who has to play the strong woman to three. Ch- the three. You know. Do you know the uh, uh, um, men Guys roles that are pained. Yeah, <sighs> men men that are are seriously damaged goods. <laughs> right. Yeah. In the screenplay, they actually Angelique says. Uh, in the fr- at the end of the French segment, she mentioned she says he must have no bloodline lest his genius is reborn and used against this. Yeah, and it's like that explains everything so much more logically. In the in the film, all these things just kind of happen because they need to, uh-huh. but like nothing is really connected because they just remove so much stuff that you're just like, okay, I guess we're moving on, even though none of this makes any sense. Letters like, from a killer, too. By the way, she's the um, she is the girlfriend of a killer. <laughs> of course, she is. 
<laughs> Good stuff. She's still acting today, by the way. She's got something coming out called 5,000 Blankets. I don't know what it's about, but it's coming out sometime in 2022 or three. But she hasn't done huh. anything since COVID. And even before that, uh, it was like 2016. She was she had done anything. Yeah. I mean, I was. I know she's heavy on the convention circuit. So. Oh yeah, that's right. I did see her doing a con with uh, Mark. Yeah, she's she's done a lot of them that oh, I've attended. God, his hair is terrible. This and like yeah. comb over looking thing he's got doing. This this wacky, gross thing that's draining all over his face. Oh, I think the French would be so insulted by this movie. <laughs> <laughs> his death in the movie is like. It's such a pale comparison. Again, I know I keep saying that, everyone, and I'm really sorry, but, like, it gives the audience a lot more gore. But in the in the script, it's so much more sophisticated, and it's so much more of a, like, brilliant comeuppance. Right. And, and it's also way too drawn out in the film. Like, you can literally hear, like, the wine scene saying, like, more gore. We need more gore. Because it's, like, it's just... I can see Harvey. I can see Harvey saying more sex. We need a sex scene in here. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, sex and Hellraiser go hand in hand, obviously. But um, uh, I just also want to point out for the idiot in the test audience that said, "Oh, there's no Pinhead in this." We saw Pinhead for a flashing sequence when he gets summoned. Nothing else happens, and now we're at mm-hmm. 28 minutes and 0.6 seconds, seven seconds. Still no Pinhead. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, but the beginning of the script in the original book is like I would have to say a good 30 minutes into the movie, and there's no pinhead in the book either. So I don't know what the big like switcheroo change needed to be for, other than studio interference for the sake of studio interference. Yeah, I think it was just their way of trying to compete with characters like Freddy Krueger and you know is Jason. There, and... Is there art online for us to see what Angelique looks like without her human skin on? You know, I I feel like I've seen that before. Um, I wouldn't know off the top of my head, but I feel like I have seen it. Okay. But I don't know if it was official or if it was just some fan's idea of, you know, what she would look like. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, um, there's um, th- there's always those ambiguous, you don't know what the thing looks like underneath the mask unless the fan mm-hmm. art shows it off kind of thing. Uh, Cobra Commander, uh, you know, Destro, uh, Snake Eyes, those are all G.I. Joe characters that wear masks and you never see what they really look like, but sometimes the comics do reveal Michael Myers. Yeah, in Mm -hmm. in, like in um, Jason Goes to Hell, you never actually get to see Jason's actual face in Jason Goes to Hell. Um, Mm -hmm. Neither do you in Jason X. You know, it's very, very... Or Freddy vs. Jason. Those are three movies that you don't get to see Jason's, you know, new mangled, messed up makeup face. So in this, it would be the same thing. Uh, there's a character in Batman Beyond uh, that when she gets her robe mask ripped off or whatever, the, char- the character who sees it is like, <gasps> oh, whatever. And later on online, they, they, they do reveal it, and it is pretty. Oh, cool. It is definitely not something to put on the the, the WB Kids cartoon. It, it, it's pretty mangled up. So, wow. uh, um, you know, she's got like, How... a ten, she's got like, by the way, like a 10 out of 10 body, but the face is like, no, put the bag on. <laughs> <laughs> How does, uh, how does... Jacques. Ah, 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 ow, ow. How does he manage to be this stupid? Like, he's made it 200-some years without forgetting that you can't stand in hell's way. But this is the one day that he forgets to, to not let her do what she wants. Like, Right. And do you think I she's been this way willingly, or do you think she's getting um, whatever the reverse of... Uh, she? I mean, she's, um, she's a slave to his uh, desire. Oh, well, yeah, he's dead. A slave to his <laughs> desires? I... I I mean, don't forget, they're from hell, so the whole slavery, um, non-consensual sexual intercourse stuff, that, that those rules are kind of thrown out the window. It's like animals, you know what I mean? Right. It's You see one animal fuck another, and he's trying to get away. It's the animal kingdom. It's okay. Yeah. Or like my co-host, we were watching um, uh, some anime movie, which is not hentai, but does have a very hentai-like scene in it, and I'm like how do you describe this movie? And she's like, well, she's a demon from another dimension. This is just like, you know, whatever for her. Nothing non-consensual about this whatsoever. I'm like, are you sure? She's like, nope, she's totally into it. I'm like, okay. (laughs) This is, uh, 
and that is my uh, and that by the way is my Wicked City commentary. Go listen to it with my act, my actress co-host Mel Heflin from the Supernatural Creatures of Lore podcast. Uh, she is a diehard uh, fan of uh, naughty anime. <laughs> Alrighty then. <laughs> she uh, this scene before I forget to oh, mention. Oh, that costume! In, in the script, there's they mention the building moving and operating in a way that we never see it in the film, which again, it's a total shame because I feel like, you know, if they were willing to do the kind of cartoony CGI in the beginning of the movie, why didn't they do the cartoony CGI for the building? Because like, it was so much bigger than this in the script, you know, the way that the the building functions in this film, it's kind of like, like look at behind what's behind him. It's like a really bad, like two piece, like, it looks like it came out of a jack in the box. You know what I mean? And in the, in the screenplay, it describes something that is beyond comprehension, almost the way the building moves in and of itself. It's just goddamn Weinstein's. <laughs> yeah. Um, this guy. Okay. This is, so this is like in the original script as well. This, this plays out mm-hmm. just like, it. this is how she summons um, uh, Pinhead. Um, yes. Why she can't just do it herself, but I guess you need a blood sacrifice to open a gate to hell. Yeah, you need someone else, I guess, to operate the lemon configuration. Okay, um, also, the biggest problem I have with Pinhead is going to come up in this movie very soon. Um, not quite I'm yet. Sure, I'm, but sh- I'm sure I know what it is. It but... doesn't make any sense, because even though Pinhead is a demon of hell... Uh, you got to be a bad person in order to get into hell, like Frank or um, Julia or Doctor right. Mar- doc- the the doctor from the psych psychiatry office. Right. The girl, the little girl, the mute girl who is in the psych ward with Christy could open the thing, but they needed her to get corrupted in order to take her, because you right. have to be a bad person in order to go to hell. Right. So there's a scene right. coming up that I'm just really bothered by, not because of just, oh, children and dogs in danger sort of thing. But anyway, this guy has got a wife and kids, apparently, so she's going to cheat on his wife and kids. Um, so that's his excuse. Right. Is this where the box was laid into the last movie? Yes, in the concrete. And this is this is another one of those things that in the script, the, there's um, this is a perfect example of what happened to this film because – in the script, she removes the configuration from the pillar in the basement in a similar way, but she presses her hand against the concrete, and the concrete sort of morphs into dust and just kind of disappears as she does. And it's such a more beautiful like example of like Peter's elegant writing and the elegant manner in which these minions of hell have always operated. In the film, it's like, well, we can't afford to turn stuff into dust, so let's just have her punch through it like a dullard. It's like... It, it really shows how this film was just kind of bludgeoned into submission because that would – I mean, how much cooler would it have been to just see her gently press against that pillar and the concrete just kind of turns into, like, atmosphere and she just pulls it out? That's so much more what the Cenobites do, you know? That's how they are supposed to operate, not like the Hulk. Do we know who this actor is? Um, I remember looking it up when I was reading the script because, again, he looks super familiar. Louis, Louis – Mustillo, I think it was. Okay, yeah, he's sharp, just just sharp, which is yeah, I guess very yeah. funny. Um, he's got a ton of credits. Yeah, and he's still acting today. He's in the Magic Hour in Cooper's Bar. I don't know what that is. A lot of lost. I mean, everyone's been on Law and Order. Uh, have you been? Haven't you been on Law and Order? Uh, no, not yet. Okay, did you audition for Law? I thought I read. So I thought you posted saying you auditioned for something with Law and Order. No, I don't. I don't think that was. Me. Oh, that was somebody else I know. Oh, that's gonna be painful. Oh, that the wall just sucks. splits open like that, <sighs> and it looks so cheap. That's just two people on either side pulling open a styrofoam piece of styrofoam. Yep. Oh, by yep. the way, this thing, the Chatterer dog, as it's called in the script, it reminds mm-hmm. me of of um, Bronx, the dog from Gargoyles. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> I love that in the script it mentions that it's a nod to the the chatterer from the first two films, almost as if that's how he was reincarnated. Right. I'm not sure why that would be the case, but the way Peter wrote it in the script, it's almost like this is the kind of diminished form of chatterer. Here's Pinhead finally and the wonderful Christopher Young music. And the amazing uh, work they did on the costume too. I mean, it just it looks like the way it's supposed to. It looks good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's amazing. It's well done. Also, 
out of all four of the Hellraiser movies uh, that were in theaters, I think this one looks the cleanest in terms of oh, cinematography it, because you really see the detail, whereas the first two films are very grimy and grungy, even on Blu-ray, yes. and I, yes. I think they're meant to be. Oh, God, her costume is fantastic. Um, but <laughs> this whole thing, is that a neck brace, by the way, in the back of his head? <laughs> <laughs> Pinhead just had an accident on his way in. By the way, so do you I know to... do you know what happens to Pinhead in the final Pinhead story written by co-written by Clyde Barker? I haven't written I haven't uh, read it yet. Okay, no. those are the Boom Studio comic books. Um, right. In, in the middle of the ongoing series before the four mini series that wrap up the whole storyline because there's an ongoing series for 20 issues, an annual and then four mini series. Um Sorry, two miniseries. One lasts a while. The other one lasts like six issues. I think it's called Beastery, but I forget what the other one is. Anyway, long story short, by the 10th issue, Christy takes Pinhead's place in hell. Oh, jeez. She becomes the hell priestess. Uh, Pinhead hmm. removes all the pins from, her, from his head, shaves her head, and then she drives him into her skull, and then she gets like this like virgin white-looking costume on, and she runs hell now. Huh. The problem is, uh, it's to help Pinhead's human go back to Earth, but what comes back to Earth is not the soldier from World War One. It's Pinhead himself in human form. Oh, interesting. So I'll she is tricked. Out. So Christie is tricked into believing that she is freeing Pinhead finally, because he is an innocent. But it's hmm. revealed that that person is forever dead, and it is actually the demon Pinhead taken human form. So it's basically Doug Bradley drawn in comics with Pinhead's like attitude. <laughs> oh, I'll have to check that out. Yeah. For it's, sure. it's kind of like on supernatural, the, 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 the form that, that Lucifer took Nick, when Lucifer was finally expelled from his body and he was sent back to earth fully human, he became a serial killer. Of course he did. <laughs> well, because he was so corrupted by, 10 years of the devil inhabiting his body. Right. But that's what I'm saying. Of course he did. Right. Um, Sam, and Dean, Sam, and, Sam and Dean thought they were doing something good, and in fact, they were just unleashing a human serial killer on the world. Awesome. Yeah. Bro. Oh, boy. Look at this CGI. Good stuff. Not too terrible for the time, I think. No, not so bad. We should, we should also mention, uh, because it's happened in the script at this point, they, the movie completely excises every single scene that we get with merchants having dreams about his grandmother. And that's also stuff that like fills out a lot of the motivations for merchants and Angelique and Pinhead and et cetera. And it, when Angelique and Pinhead first met in the basement of that building, she mentions there's a scene in the French uh, version or the French segment where she has these clowns that go with her everywhere. And they're kind of like the Cenobites before the Cenobites, which I thought was cool the way the, the script brings him back when she, when she meets Pinhead in the basement of this building. She's like, you're different from the clowns. And he's like, no, we do things a lot differently nowadays. It's a lot more boring, but efficient. Yeah, you know? I, and it's, yeah I remember that. It's cool because it shows us that she predates Pinhead. She had the same kind of role. Like it fills out all of that stuff so that there's a rivalry between Pinhead and Angelique that isn't really explained as well in the film. Right. Their whole dynamic, again, for somebody – who had not seen the previous Hellraiser movies, I knew at least a lot about them enough that mm. it was just things were not making any sense to me. Like this whole, like, there's this rival, as you just said, rivalry between Pin and Angelique. I'm like, where the hell did this come from? I, mm -hmm. I have actually, I had, I did see at least the first film before watching this in theaters. Um, but this was the first one I ever saw in theaters. So I right. didn't, oh, great sex scene. And uh, <laughs> there is, uh, it's just very whispery and very like Lifetime movie of the week or 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 yeah. Or I like the rotating bed. That that's a nice cheesy Vegas touch. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, the the rivalry just doesn't make a lot of sense because there's no context of why it happened. And Angelique doesn't really ever show up in a lot of other other media. Uh, I don't think she showed up in the Scarlet Gospels. I mean, she's basically a character for the movie, so. Right, but that's but to see that's to me that was the greatest shame because it's like if if they had left the script alone and just filmed what was in the script, it gives us that the reason for their rivalry and it explains more why and how she predates him and how he's kind of pissed that she's back and like 
it also totally explains, you know, giving giving us dialogue. It says that they don't immediately kill Merchant because they need him to unleash the Holocaust that exists within the building. You know, like as it stands in the film, it it doesn't make any sense. They would have just killed him immediately because it's like they just kind of assume that we know that. And it's like, well, how do you expect the viewer to know that when you've taken out half the lines and half the scenes? Right. So... Who is the little? Who is the son? We haven't discussed who the son is in this movie. Um, I'm trying to. What's his name again? I can't remember. For a long time, I thought it was. Um, uh, what's Jack. his name? Jack. Jack. I thought uh, Jack, Jack yeah. was Gage from um, from Pet Cemetery. <laughs> no, I guess the actor's name is Cortland Mead. Right. He, he was, was uh, the little rascals. The, the little rascals. Folks. And he was David. He was Danny Torrance in the in the Shining uh, made for TV ser- made for TV movie TV series. Oh, okay. He I hasn't no acted since in ten in in uh, twelve years. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, he's been absent for a while. Right, but he was the voice of Gus Griswold on Re- Recess for 127 episodes. I guarantee, and that was a Nickelodeon cartoon or a Disney cartoon, plus all the merchandising they used with his voice and and also the character. That I guarantee that netted him a chunk of change that he can live on for the rest of his life. Probably. Yeah. Um, that's good, on that's top good of, work when you can get it. Yeah, I mean, on top of all the other work he ever did before, Young and the Restless and so on and so forth, as long as he had good parents and a good agent, he would he would be set for life. But but being on 127 episodes of a cartoon series on Disney, yeah. cha-ching! That's good money. <laughs> yeah, um, you, you don't need to work again. You you If you were smart, oh, here's the twins, and they are played was- by... I had it up on my screen. Hold on. Oh, okay. Michael Polish and Mark Polish. They are actual twins in real life, which is nice. They're not one actor. It's not It's not uh, our friend Cannibal, Cannibal the Hannibal Lecter, Arnie Hammer, playing the same character. <laughs> I'm assuming yeah, you heard about that, ball. right? <laughs> say, say that again, sorry. I'm assuming you heard about that. Arnie Hammer is a, <laughs> right up yes, there with Cannibal the Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> I have, unfortunately. This uh, is all... All of this stuff with the twins was added to this this um, modern quote unquote modern day setting. They don't show up until uh, the future in the script until we're out in space. Okay, so, so they don't whole, have an origin in the script. That's right. No, this whole thing was added, and again, it's like I don't know if it's a mandate from the studio chiefs because they wanted more gore and more pinhead, or because Kevin you know Jaeger thought oh this would be a really cool FX showcase and. I, I, you know, it's one of those things that I would love to ask Peter about in terms of does he know who decided this had to happen? Because it, to me, it's like you could have truncated this scene by about four fifths of the time and given us more of the stuff that this film needed. So, in all honesty, when it got into questions about like what do you remember, Peter's mm-hmm. pretty much universal answer right in the very beginning was it was right, twenty five years ago. Yeah. All right. Well, so he really came on to talk about like the the book, fi- the the script finally coming out in book, and then talking about some stuff behind the scenes about like you know you sitting on it for a while, and then just a lot of other kind of questions about it. But when it came to asking him really detailed questions, it became a very like twenty five years ago kind of thing. <laughs> gotcha. This scene we should we should mention as well that this scene between Angelique and Pinhead is added it is not in the original script and i think they did it to kind of make up for a, some of the stuff that they took out between pinhead and angelique before because there was a scene preceding this in the script where they you know kind of confront each other in a similar way but after she leaves pinhead summons all of his cenobites and he's like look she's not going to take care of this shit we have to do it ourselves and they, there's a little bit of that in this film with that scene with the dog eating the bird mm-hmm. but it's nowhere near the same as it was in the script and again the way this the scene between him and her appears in the film where he cuts in her chest it again it it forces angelique to just kind of be this spectator who just sits and watches as everything like kind of happens and i it would be interesting to figure out is that because back in that day everyone was like well that's what women do, you know, or is it because they just thought no one will care about her because everyone cares about Pinhead. And here we get to the FX showcase. <laughs> it's coming up. Yeah, she does become just kind of like a, a side character after 
Pinhead um, mutilates her, like, yeah. really just completely, like, nothing for this Lost movie. Yeah. She yeah. is a huge part of this film, and then after that, she is a nobody character. She is a, oh, we're going to make her all gothed up and, you know, S&M sexy now. Right. And it's, and again, I, I would recommend to people who are fans of this series, this franchise and the character, go read the script because if they would have left it alone, Angelique would have been just so much more of an epic character than she turned out to be. And it's a shame because she's the, the actress is beautiful. She's clearly talented. And the way she appears in the future segments, you know, that's an unforgettable kind of appearance. So it's, Hey, I meant to ask you, what's your, uh, you said that you, you have a huge problem with pinhead in this film. What, what was it? Um, Oh, it was the, um, is it the makeup? No, 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 no. I don't have a problem with pinhead. I just had a problem with like the continuity with the other stories, like just kind of look like they're being ignored. That was my big disconnect with the film was that as much, and, and pinhead is in it a lot, but after now reading the original script, it's, it's, I'd prefer, I'd prefer what they did. My original comment, like, I think it was like a year ago on Facebook, was just like, I just felt like the film had a big disconnect with the other films, and now we know why. And the script or whatever definitely never really touches upon the other films in any way. Gotcha. This is very, by the way, this is very H.R. Giger, these masks remind me of. Even though Mm -hmm. Giger had nothing to do with this movie. (laughs) Medieval H.R. Giger, almost. And uh, I thought you were going to say that your problem with Pinhead was the makeup because it looks no, it like in this, in, in this film, it looks like the makeup has been um, modified to just be a pullover. I don't know if it would have been probably foam latex, I'm assuming, but it looks almost like a pullover mask that has the eyes and the mouth cut out. And that's kind of one of the problems with the photography in this film, in my opinion, is in a lot of the close-ups, you can see the seams on his under his chin and around his eyes and everything, because it's just too brightly lit, which kind of touches upon what you were talking about earlier. And it surprised me because, I mean, I know part of it is that we're watching an HD, you know, 4k or whatever it is version, but I, even back then, I feel like makeups were photographed in a way that kind of hid those sort of scenes a little better. And Mm -hmm. I was kind of surprised because a lot of this film was directed by Kevin. So it's kind of like, he knows how makeup works. You would have thought that he and the DP would have said, we got to tone down this lighting a little more. Cause like in this close up of pinhead, like I can see the makeup on the side of his mouth. You can clearly see it's not glued down. You know? um, and again, it's not a big deal. It's just one of those things that you don't notice that in the first two films. So there's apparently somebody inside the beast costume, by the way, his name is Jody St. Michael. Uh, he's referred to online as the beast. He is still acting today. Something's in post production. He's additional crew in George of the jungle. He's a mime artist in gorillas in the mist. He's the centaur being in uh, monkey bone, which I remember. Um, Interesting. I don't know if he's like a little person or is he just, you know, on his hind legs. It, there's no information about him on IMDb whatsoever, but, uh, his first there acting is role. Someone there. there was his, there was his first acting role. By the way, it was 1979 on Chips. Huh. A young and a uh, very young. Yeah, this is this is again we're, we're this part of the film, you know, as as it exists in its final form. There is so much of this scene between Merchant and Angelique that comes after this that they completely took out uh-huh. so that the next time we see merchant, I'm sure, you know, you, you notice this, he just kind of comes running into the building and you're like, well, why is he running into the building in a panic? Like, how does he know what the hell is going on? Because they never filmed the remainder of that scene between him and Angelique. And that, so again, it just makes you kind of like, okay, this makes no sense at all. Mm. And do you really believe that in a building as beautiful as the one they live in with the apartments is beautiful and as gorgeously artistic as they live in, that their laundry room looks like that. I'm like, come on. Like, that's... Give me a break. I'm sure it was cheap to film this this way, but it's just... And it goes on forever, this sequence. This is another thing that just goes on and on, probably because they had so much coverage because it was easy to film, you Mm -hmm. know, and it was cheap. But it's like, cut half of this to get in more dialogue that helps us understand what the fuck is happening. Because... 
Otherwise, it's just things happening. Again, that there's no motivation. I'm going to point something out about the washer and dryer. The building she mm-hmm. lives in is mm-hmm. obviously very expensive and for very rich people who have a lot of money. Uh, I mean, her husband is an award-winning architect, so they have mm-hmm. cash to spend. Yeah. But yep. they have a coin-op washer and dryer in the basement? <laughs> Not to mention it would probably be in their unit. She wouldn't have to go down to the laundry. That but makes, okay, that makes no sense to me at all. <laughs> yeah. So this is and also the first time we, in four films, we've ever seen Pinhead interact with somebody that is not. It, it, it's on a very more domestic level. This is a you know she is a housewife. I don't know what her role is in life in this in the context of the universe. I'm assuming that right. she is just home taking care of the kid, which is totally fine. Right. But Pinhead's interaction with Christy and Julia and the little girl and then the the girl the, 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 the reporter yeah Tiffany the reporter from the third movie and and the scumbag who owns the club. You know, mm-hmm. those are all, like, very different characters compared to Mom and the little boy. This is like a yeah. Freddy moment. This is something Freddy would definitely do. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, I think a lot of this film suffers from Freddy-itis. You know, it's it's coming in the shadow of the Freddy era, and it just feels like they, they wanted to compete with that, which is yeah. not the right move for a Hellraiser film. But Freddy at this point was done. This was 1996, so there is... Freddy, uh, what, 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 uh, when did a new news, a new nightmare come out? Ninety four, right? The year before Scream. Ninety four, yeah. So this but was like felt, this is it, on the cusp of, um, the the pretty people horror movies, as I like to call them, the Scream. Right, but, the, I know what you did last summer, you know, things yeah, like but, that. But Hollywood's always a little like they they cash in on stuff some you know a little late sometimes and maybe they just thought that it would still work you know maybe they thought that you know in the era of wishmaster and stuff like that that this sort of thing would play as well i mean i don't know that it's actually wishmaster was later sorry but that's that's the only thing i can think wishmaster that, that was yeah you're right it was like uh wishmaster was 1997 which was also written by peter atkins yeah and he was the uh, he he did the first one, not the two sequels, which I've never seen the sequels. I've only ever seen the first one. Yeah, I've seen that. I'm the same way. I don't. By the way, feel that, like I need to see the other two. I just the first one was fine. I'm like, I don't. This is not a franchise I need to dive into for multiple sequels. No, and this this hallway in the in the script, the way it was designed, uh-huh. it's so much more chilling. Yeah, like the things that he sees and the things that he hears and the things that he walks past. It's bone chilling. Like in the movie, again, it just comes off as like kind of a cheap haunted house. You know, <laughs> I mean, I hate to say that. You I, mean I like the like family. the ones that we 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 have both probably worked at in some capacity in our lives of of yes. not our professional okay. careers. <laughs> yes, and also look if you look in the background when he first enters this room. By the way, you see that pillar that we mentioned from Hellraiser three, but again, oh, yeah. it looks. It looks like a cheapened version of what we saw before. Right. Also, Pin has had Pinhead in these two with these two, mom and dad, has like some serious like conversation, like just like, hey, let's just let's have a let's have a talk. You know, let's I Pinhead is not one to get his hands bloody, like he's not Freddy like sticking his glove into someone's eye sockets and pulling out their eyeballs. Or right, Jason right. ripping you know, breaking someone's neck or back. He'll he'll have things that happen to do it for you. But this is seriously out of all the Hellraiser movies, the most chatty Pinhead has ever been. Now, the yeah. films that follow this are all mostly garbage. I have given Inferno a second chance because it's the first film directed by Scott Derrickson or one of his first movies. So mm-hmm. I, I, I am beginning to give that a bit of a pass. Um, JoeBlow.com mm-hmm. did an amazing review of it and saying people need to give Inferno a better chance. The other films, they almost agree, are all garbage. Uh, I think it's right. Peter Atkins that's on the s- Leviathan a DVD, right? That mm-hmm. is talking about all the other Hellraiser movies. I think so. Yeah. Okay, because he talks about three, because the documentary focuses on one and two, but three gets its own little section with Peter, and then they right. go into a deep dive on like, okay, let's discuss the other films. <laughs> yeah, we have to we have to acknowledge these in some way. <laughs> The Dead Mouse production, ooh, love it. The Dead Mouse production people uh, are aware that we are doing this too because I just got done talking to them about uh, Pennywise, the story of it, and giving me an update on where the hell Robo Doc is. 
<laughs> it's coming. It's coming. It's a distribution thing now, so it's it's a whole new level of uh, hurry up and wait. Yeah, the, and that part of the hurry up and wait can always be a freaking nightmare. So is this a gateway the, to hell that they're in, or is this hell itself? I always just assumed it was like a gate between reality and hell, that, that this is kind of the, the hallway to hell, and the room that he ends up in where, where Pinhead enters is some subsect of hell like it's just the entrance or something kind of like in the first or in the second film you know how the the hallway opens in the hospital and etc cetera, etc cetera. i always assumed it was something like that and even in the first film there's that hallway that opens in, in christie's hospital room i think it's that same thing it's just again done in a sort of I don't know, cheaper way. I don't, I don't, again, I don't want to just make it sound like I'm shitting all over this film. No, it's, but. it's totally fine. You can, you can, you can say something bad as long as you follow it up with something good. <laughs> yeah. Did and you, I, by I, the I, way, did you read Scarlet Gospels? The actual Clive Barker yeah. sequel to the Hellbound Heart? I read it, but it's been a really long time. Okay. That is also so. for anyone who's not familiar with, um, the book is also the story where Pithead meets the detective from Lord of Illusions. <laughs> Mm-hmm. That is that book. That is that story. That is that is uh, the detective, whatever his name is, the private investigator from Lord of Illusions, uh, which is a hit or miss film too, by the way. Uh, yes. I recently tried rewatching it, and I was like, God, this is not actually as good as I remember. Do I love this because I love Scott Bakula? That is probably why I wanted to watch this movie again because I like Scott Bakula, but this is not a good movie. <laughs> Harry, I think, was Harry Dean and Stanton Henderson, Anderson, something like that. Uh, let me look real quick on yeah. IMDb. Harry D'Amour. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. By the way, Pinhead yeah. is lit perfectly in this with his eyes yeah. in the shadow. That's how, yeah, that's how he. Sh- that's how you should be lighting that makeup. Like, yes. If you if you overexpose it, you start to see the little tiny secrets. Everyone's like, "Oh, Doug Bradley should play Pinhead again." And I'm like, "Dude, Doug Bradley is in his 70s. Do you really think he wants to put that costume back on?" Probably not so much. No. Very, you have a I, you have a beautiful 30 something, I don't know her actual age, actress from Sense8 that's going to be putting that makeup on. Let her do it. She's in her 30s. She can take yeah. it. She can ta- she can take the rigors. Uh, yeah. Opening she- but, okay, you want to hear the funniest thing? Did you ever watch Real Sensei? Fun. No. Mm-mm. Oh, you you should. It's it's not terrible. It's about a bunch of people who share kind of like a high mind. Um, oh, burst the door. That's like Jason Voorhees in Friday Part 4. Um, her introduction to the audience in Sensei is getting ass-fucked by the actress from Doctor Who, the black companion of David Tennant. Okay. With a multicolored rainbow strap on. Okay. <laughs> and she takes it off and does just a slop on the floor sound effect <laughs> as they're okay. cuddling in bed. That is how you are introduced to her in Sense Eight. <laughs> All righty then. Terrific. This uh, is another. <laughs> this is another thing, by the way, that makes no sense. Angelique, in the film, she appears out of nowhere, and she's now just kind of pissed. And it makes no sense, again, because nope. of stuff that wasn't filmed. Nope. Because in the this, in this script, she says, open the pathway for me, you know, because she wants to have him open um, the design to get rid of Pinhead, but then to open the pathway to hell for her so she can command it. Again, all of that stuff was just completely redu- uh, eliminated from the film, this great fucking rivalry between her and Pinhead and them kind of scheming against each other, which... Again, that's such a cool idea to add to a Hellraiser film because we've never seen that before. Mm-hmm. And instead, it's just reduced to this kind of people, you know, do things because script. special effects. Yeah. Or because of script rewrites. Yeah. Um. And this in the in the in the screenplay again, the idea of the when he finally. You know, the box turns on, which I know I'm speaking ahead of what's happening on film. I'm That's sorry. Right. I just wanted to make sure no, that I, get, the, I get uh, it in there. I'm at one minute, 54 seconds, and uh, there's a light show happening. Right. No, but I mean, in the, I'm talking about when the box sucks everything back in. In the script, the way it's written, oh, it, right. it's so cool. In this film, everything just kind of goes, bust bloom, and it's like, okay. Oh. His death scene, 
it's gnarly. Yeah, the, I, I, when I, I, when I watched this for the first time a week or a week ago, because I needed to give it a watch uh, prior to doing this, um, just because mm-hmm. I'll be like online, like looking up people's IMDb and stuff like that. Uh, right. I, I was, I, I completely forgot that's how he got killed. I was like, I remember he yeah. dies, but I'm like, oh, he dies badly. Mm-hmm. Oh God, and that just effect this- is. It, it's it's hit or miss for me. Just the whipping of the chains around. Yeah. Oh, the light. Probably, oh, probably the light. In reverse, <laughs> Pin, I'm guessing. Pinhead's reaction to the light hitting him is like, oh, oh, it's, oh, it's annoying. <laughs> and now it's he's annoying. reacting. Now he's reacting like the way he should be. Yeah. I feel like the scene of, because in the script, Pinhead, even though Merchant turns on the good device, the one that's supposed to take them or eliminate them, Pinhead manages to avoid it by jumping to the ceiling and he wraps his chains around Angelique and begins to have her drug into the light, which again, that's expanding on that rivalry. And I feel like maybe the shot of her having the chains wrap around her was filmed for that because it, it plays out exactly like it does in the script. It's mm-hmm. just changed because, you know, reasons. So do you know what famous director was supposed to work on this movie as well? Um, I'm sure I read it at some point, but I have no idea at this point. Stuart Gordon. Oh, yeah, that's right. Known for his low-budget horror movies, was approached to direct, but backed after artistic disagreements. Can't imagine what those are. Special effects technician Kevin Yeager, who we know, was subsequently hired after his cost-saving directing work on Tales from the Tales from the Crypt. Uh, for Joe Silver. Jaeger was initially hesitant about taking the job as he did not want to be retread of the previous installments of the series. However, he was impressed with the script and became enthusiastic after Barker described his vision for the film. Barker was heavily involved in the first four Hellraiser films. It was after that that he wasn't. So if you feel like the Hellraiser movies have a certain type of class about them, especially the first two, the third one, again, always feels very out of place. And that's probably because of a uh, 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 camera head Cenobite, <laughs> but uh, the th- the fourth one, I definitely feel Barker's touch in the movie. Yes, m- most definitely. It's trying, like I said, I feel like it's trying really hard to get back to what Hellraiser really is all about at the core of its story. It's just, this it is got, a- you know... This is also known as the, this is also known as the belly button crew, by the way. Everyone's got their nice, flat ab belly button showing. <laughs> <laughs> I uh hey, I dated if you a, got it, launch it. <laughs> I dated a woman a few months ago who had um a a big thing about her belly button uh being touched. That was her her zone, if you will. I was like, Really? She's like, Yeah, that's why I got the piercing and I was like, Where does that come from? She's like, I think it comes from Hellraiser. Oh wow. <laughs> Interesting. She's like, you know, the regular <laughs> area is totally fine, but the belly button, that's my spot. And I was like, Okay. <laughs> Yeah. And she's Whatever like, it comes, yeah, basically, and it came, <laughs> comes from this. The other thing the that way. they talk about in the panel yesterday that I was at, the Clyde Barker panel at Necronomicon, was the resurgence of Clyde Barker in the media today has been uh, overwhelmingly positive. However, um, you know, the, the, Candyman was not toted as like this big adaptation of the story by Clyde Barker as much as the books of blood were on Hulu, which was not well received as far as I'm aware. And I have not seen them, so I can't comment any further, but the upcoming pinhead Hellraiser film or whatever we're going to be getting with this new Hellraiser uh, redo uh, will hopefully do that. And I hope to see things like weave world happen or the damnation game or the once in future show, you know, things like that. Supposedly, On HBO Max, we're supposed to be getting a Hellraiser series, but HBO Max, Warner Brothers Discovery is all in hell itself right now with the new CEO making all the changes that he's making. Yeah. So, so we'll don't see. Hold your breath. <laughs> I mean, do you remember years ago them talking about a Hellraiser TV series and them showing like a remote control with pins sticking out of it? Not really. Yeah, honestly. look it up. Yeah, this is not the first time we've ever heard of a Hellraiser uh, film. Um, By the way, this this character of Rimmer yep. is completely different from her character in the film. There's a character in the film named Corrine. Oh, the book. Uh, I mean, sorry, in the screenplay. The screenplay. A, a, sorry, there's a character in the screenplay named Corrine who is basically who Rimmer is. Rimmer is in the screenplay, but it's like maybe two scenes at best. Do you want to guess what the Rotten Tomatoes score of this movie is? I looked it up the other day just to see, and I'm guessing it's somewhere in the teens. Uh, a little better than that. 
<laughs> Interesting. Um, this film, and Peter talked about this on my show, will never ever get an uncut director's release. They There's would have to drop. <laughs> correct. And what's another film that came out this time, directed by Paul W. S. Anderson, which is also very similar. Event Horizon. Event Horizon and Hellraiser Bloodlines are basically hell in space. And according to Paul W. S. Anderson, and I guarantee the same thing would apply to this film, you would need, as he put it, a Justice League style budget in order to redo that film and put it into the way the fans want. And he said yeah. he does never ever seeing a studio doing that. Unless so much to do so much to do it animated. Maybe, but honestly, it's like, what if studios started getting into Kickstarter campaigns for films that want to be put out there, but they're like, listen, if you want to do it, you're going to pay for it. And that's yeah. our attitude. Now, some fans will be like, oh, you have all your money, but you want the fans' money, blah, 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 blah. Ooh, love it. He turns into Frank. He's basically like, uh, this is exactly like Frank now. Um, yeah. I will play devil, devil's advocate here. And say that as much as I disagree with studios doing that, I have to agree with them. If you want Hellraiser Bloodlines Collector's Edition with all the deleted scenes and the restructuring back in place and Event Horizon and God, let's go to Wes Craven's uh, werewolf movie. Cursed. You got to put your money where your mouth is. And if the DVDs or Blu-rays are going to cost $50 and that's what you want to see finally, then fund the project. I'm, I'm yeah. shocked there isn't some studio executive who hasn't thought of this already going – Let's get the fans to fund it. They want to see it. Why don't we just put it on Kickstarter or put a survey out there to everybody? You know, put it, call all the horror networks and all the horror websites and say, hey, start a survey for us. Would you fund Wolf on Kickstarter? Would you fund Event Horizon on Kickstarter? Yeah. Well, it's not a bad idea. It's just, would you? I, I think, would I? I yeah. Would fund I would fund Cursed. I wouldn't fund Event Horizon, or and I would probably fund Hellraiser Bloodline. But I mean, it's you're asking a lot from the fans because a lot of the fans they, they don't, don't care don't how they get their stuff. They just want to see it, and, and a lot and, of them, you know, yeah. And, and don't forget, and, and 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 here's the thing: Justice League's budget to get it to where it needed to be was somewhere in the vein of forty to seventy million dollars. Yeah. For a film yeah. that went to HBO Max. Yeah, they're not doing that for Hellraiser Bloodline. I no. And do you think the new regime at Warner Brothers would ever done that now with all the cancellations no. they're doing? He especially with uh, What's His Face in Trouble? And he's and he got new scenes put back in that movie? Fuck no. By the way, um, this gun is awesome. <laughs> it's stupid, but it's should, awesome. <laughs> we should also mention that uh, the, the death of the soldier in the air duct. There's or the the death of the soldier in the hallway is completely different in this in the screenplay. Oh right. He hides in an air duct and he gets uh, chewed by the dog while he's in an air duct. And also, hilarious to me when reading the screenplay that Peter went to great lengths to spell out, you know, this entire station is supposed to be made of rock because it, originally it's kind of built into an asteroid. And in the and he says he's like it is not metal it is not metal it is not metal and then you see in the finished film everything looks like cheap metal and I'm just like again that's kind of a perfect example of what they did to this film they're like ah eh, fuck you Peter we're changing it because it's cheaper to just put up plywood and paint it gray and speckle it than to you know create rock facades this by the way the guard the other this one right here the one that's on screen right now the one that had the giant fucking bazooka sniper rifle is Pat Skipper you have seen him in. Thousands of things. He is one of those actors. Yeah, recognizable face, but he, you you might not ever know his name. Right. He's in Bosch. Um, he is in uh, the X Files, Shameless, Yellowstone. But mm -hmm. seriously, throw a rock. He has been. He has done stuff before. Buffy the Vampire yeah. Slayer, Walker Texas Ranger. His career goes back to 1987. Uh, Lethal... He was in the Rob Zombie Halloween. Right, but probably yeah. the biggest thing was uh, he was a hitman in Lethal Weapon 2, and he was one of the fed feds in Predator 2. Yep. That's where I always remember him from. He's got, like, a look to him, his jaw, his face structure. He's always got that, that like, um, I'm, a, I'm a badass. I play badasses. Yeah, he's got the look for a heavy, a Hollywood heavy. There's also in the in the screenplay, there's a, a scene between Paul Merchant and Angelique that takes place on the space station. 
And again, it calls back to the stuff that we saw in the quote unquote modern day era and the Ren- uh, the French uh, segment. And it's just, again, Angelique, like I said, she's just kind of forced to just walk around and do whatever Pinhead says, despite what Peter had originally envisioned. I like how and he's hiding and like Pinhead like kind of walks by. Kind of looks at him. A little bit like he's at the corner of his eye. You know, you know, Pinhead saw him. Yeah, like right there, you can kind of see his eye kind of looking to the side. Uh huh. Yep. Like he yeah. gets it. He knows. He's I like, mean, if you and I, that. if you and I can walk through some place and sense somebody's nearby, <laughs> I'm assuming yeah. a uh, a Lord of Hell. <laughs> He's not gonna have a tr- any trouble finding you, or his dog won't. I should say. Mm. Oh yeah, that's right. The 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 goofy looking dog. Yeah. There's that shot earlier in the film when it's walking on the table and you can actually see some of the mechanics behind its legs. It's like, oh, man, the really? Cheap, they just shut off the cheapest special effect in the entire movie. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but those are just lights. <laughs> yep. I mean, if, if, if anything, you could have thrown in a scene of him trying to test it, like, you know, picking up a piece of rock or whatever, or like... You know, like trying to touch it and then like getting shocked or something. Just, but it just, it's just, it looks like light from the floor. <laughs> yeah. This is where yeah. the problem, the biggest problem with the entire movie is the, right here. This entire futuristic set looks like mm. someone's garbage pile in the back of their house. The French. Or just a garage. Right. The French yeah. um, flashback was beautiful. Everything yep. looked like it was from the time period. And Angelique looks ridiculous now. Um, everything looked beautiful. Everything looked authentic. The costumes looked authentic. When you get to the modern day, very easy to do. Not a big deal. I don't have any complaints. But this entire set, it, it just looks cheap. It looks like Alien 3. It yep. looks like Alien yep. Resurrection, which I never thought looked great compared to Alien and Aliens. It's Well, again, it's, it's their way of cutting costs because for oh, them God. to build... For them to build it as it would have existed in the script, as if it existed on an asteroid that they kind of carved using lasers, Mm because they mentioned that in the script, that they carved the city into the asteroid. It just, you could tell that they're like, no, going to be too much money. Got to make it just, you know, a spaceship. Yeah. Um, This uh, shows. The the (laughs) twins, um, a a twosome is about to become a, a threesome. Yeah. Oh, man, that looks painful. I'm taking. I'm gonna take a pass on that. Thanks, folks. <laughs> I mean, it looks like chewing gum, which is fantastic, and just the blood everywhere, just ripping them apart. Yep, more blood. <sighs> more blood. More blood. More boobs. More boobs. More blood. Now more boobs. Now more blood. You can, you can tell what they wanted. You, you can see them sitting in the test audience, being like, "Where? Where's the sex? <laughs> yeah. Where's the blood? Where's the blood? Where's the gore? Where's Pinhead? You can literally see the test card when you watch the final cut. I mean, I get that you have a naked, skinless dude walking around in the first film, so you're gonna your expectations for gore and blood are gonna be pretty high. Yeah, but I mean, it makes sense in those in the first film because the story that it's constructed on works in the final cut it just doesn't work because everything just kind of is there because of test cards right so, even in the even in the screenplay this final verbal confrontation <laughs> between pinhead and paul it's so much better like it it just gives more depth it lets you like kind of feel the hearkening back to the generations that came before and and the dialogue that's in the finished film that pinhead says about earth and how it's you know so beautifully glorious and there are humans to exploit it works for pinhead i'm not knocking that it's just it does it at the sake of a more coherent story you know it's like checking boxes like i said on the test card this whole sequence by the way um so he's like "Ooh, it's earth i haven't been there in a while um you know i haven't been there since the 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 middle part of this film um Mm -hmm. so he leaves and then the next time we see him okay right here in the corridor the, right. the next time we see him, there is a serious. I just feel like a complete disconnect. Like I'm on, I'm on, looking at comic book panels, and the scene with him, her in the quarter, and then later on, when we figure out that oh, Pinhead's been talking to a hologram, it just really feels like a complete disconnect. Well, again, they didn't. 
yeah, they, I feel like this might have been added on, not added on. I feel like this was the original way because in the script, remember, uh, Paul dies. Right. He doesn't survive. And in the script, it was like, oh, everyone got to Keep angry. talking. I'll be right back. We have, to make him, we have to make him survive. So it feels like that's why it doesn't make any sense because what they filmed between Rimmer and Paul in the hallway is what they filmed from the original script. But because they changed the ending and flipped it, it just doesn't work. They should have just cut to her just running to the spaceship and excised the scene between uh, Rimmer and Paul because it would have it would have made a lot more sense given the ending that they used. But I don't think people were as concerned about things making sense based on the way things happen in this film. This is gnarly for this, for this pooch. So long pooch. Oh my God. It's like my boy in the hot dog too long. (sighs) This reminds me. That's like the shark in Jaws. It's like, it's like putting an egg in the microwave. Here it is. Here it is. He was in the corridor with what's her face. How the hell did he get here? Well, again, I, I think this is tacked on ending. I think yeah. it's different. And I, it's it because, it, because it's a hologram. We know that. So that, that that's yeah. fine. But still, it just there's some disconnect between the two scenes. Oh, a total sense of disconnect. But, it, but again, you could say, cared. right, but you could totally say, oh, because he's in the shuttle and this is a programmed hologram. So he had the hologram turn around or he was doing something and Pinhead walks in and goes, aha, I got you now. So it just, right. he fell, you know, he, he, Pinhead fell into Paul's trap, which is totally fine. Uh, right. Shuttle launch, this is straight out of Alien, because they wanted to do it like Alien, which is yep. exactly what this is, except for Pinhead's not hanging onto the side of the ship trying to get in. <laughs> but yeah. you know what would have been better? And I don't know if this would have dragged the movie out. What if the dog was trying to get into the shuttle? <laughs> <laughs> Come here, Poochie. I'm a good boy. I've been a good boy. <laughs> hey, also, I... I... I want to make sure I mention this. Watch the shots that are coming up of Pinhead being destroyed, specifically the one where he says, oh, man, you yeah. can see the, you can see the black mesh over his uh, eye socket that's supposed to look like an empty skull, uh-huh. which is, again, an, a perfect example of how the lighting in this film, even though I respect the effort, it just doesn't work for a lot of the effects. And again, it's shocking because both directors that did most of the work on this film, Kevin Yeager and Joe Chappelle, they both have experience. I mean, especially Kevin, they have extensive experience working with effects. So you're just like, how did no one realize that you can see that that's a fake eye? Like when you see it, it's like I, I, when I saw it in theaters, I was like, oh, my God, you've got to be kidding me. This effect with the with the space station transforming into the Lamont configuration Mm-hmm. I did not see coming, and I give this all the credit for – it's 90 CGI, so I don't care. But yeah. I give this all the credit. I did not fucking see this coming, that the space station is the Lamont configuration as a satellite. Yeah. That was a yeah. great secret. Yeah, it's that very is a cool. Great secret. Is that in the original script too, that the space – that the – that the space st- space station turns into the Lamic configuration. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, perfect. That's brilliant. That is like a yeah. Death Star kind of thing. That's no moon. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, that's <laughs> a little ridiculous. But okay, so what you're gonna tell us now is that all the other Hellraiser sequels that come out after this take place obviously in modern times, based on the fact that you know there's no, it's not 2120, whatever it is. Um, right. They take place when? Somewhere after Pinhead and Angelique being pulled into the box by Kim Myers, I guess. Uh, okay, but uh, we're led to believe that Pin. Oh, and then the movie just abruptly ends. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's your wrap up. That's your freaking wrap up. Um, I, I just. <sighs> it doesn't. It doesn't make sense as the. But again, they never should have made half of those sequels. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Uh, again, I give I give Inferno more props now than I did before after watching a uh, a Joe Blow video, mainly because of the, uh, um, you know, it's the first movie directed by um, Scott Derrick Do- Scott Derrickson, who just directed one of the biggest movies of the year for horror, uh, The Black Phone. Mm-hmm. So um, so we got a uh, quite the IMDb list here of people that are going way too fast for us to get into, but we'll try and pick through them a bit in the all-cast and crew. 
Um, when it says executive producer by Clive Barker, uh, he had barely anything to do with it and didn't want to. <laughs> yeah, once uh, he figured out what was happening. Um, let's see. I'm just randomly picking one. Linda Samo Drow was the makeup department behind uh, Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers, and this movie, and then that's pretty much it. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, so let's get that's over to the second unit team. Let's pick uh, Christopher T. Garagoretti, um, <laughs> whose career went up until the year 2000 when he passed away, unfortunately, at the age of 48 years old in 2004, but he was the second oh. unit director on Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, Eraser, Blue Streak, Jerry Maguire, The X-Files, Hellraiser Bloodlines, Hellraiser The Curse of Michael Myers, Tommy Boy, Patriot Games, Twin Peaks, Beauty and the Beast, the television series. So he had a pretty good career, just unfortunately he passed away in his 40s. Yeah, that's that's tragic. Yeah, so let's see. We have, uh, let's give some credit to the carpenter of the movie. The carpenter is Colleen Devine, and she did this movie and a few sex films that were probably on Skidamax, like Lady in Waiting and Good God Sex at Apple Pie. Well done. <laughs> Um, let's see who else. Let's pick uh, set dresser, uncredited Nell Sullivan, who deserves all the credit because I said the French scenes in this movie are amazing. Uh, yeah. She worked on, I'm sorry, he worked on Minority Report, Jurassic Park 3, Pirates of the Caribbean, The Majestic, Threshold, uh, Wishmaster, and Leprechaun 4 in space. So uh, they were like, hey, you did Bloodlines. Do you want to do another space movie? Sure. You've got you've got experience doing that. Um, doing that on the we should I want to real quick mention uh Pete Anthony who is one of the orchestrators okay. for for uh the, the score and he's had a huge, extremely successful career in film score and he's conducted on films such as Spider Man two and he's done orchestrations for a lot of big films like Blade Two and Spider Man and like he's just one of those names that if you mention it to composers they they're like, Oh yeah, Pete, I know Pete, great guy and Great credits. So good job, Pete. The stunt double for Angelique uh, was Joni Avery, and she did stunts in Planet of the Apes, but also she was the stunt double for Natasha Hentridge in Species. Oh, cool. Um, also, uh, another Chris Young score, I should say. Let's see. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, the Girl Next Door, she did stunts, and I'm like, were there a lot of stunts in the movie about the kid who falls in love with the former porn star? <laughs> apparently. Um, apparently, and all jokes aside, oh, she was also in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and that probably took a lot of stunts. Oh, she was in 40 episodes of VIP as well. That that was definitely a stunt-heavy show. Um, yeah. Sex scenes are also considered stunts. Oh, cool. Because of the motion and the gyrating yeah. and the, the yada, 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 and the, we all know what involves uh, can be stunts. But God... You want to talk about the the uh, the the stunt woman for Angelique's career has got stunt credits on it. Yep. Let me tell you, like a ton of them. Um, By the way, the, the special thanks they mentioned Joe Chappelle who picked up the reins after Kevin, and they mentioned Joel Swanson who was one of the big producers on Nightmare on Elm Street too. No animal was harmed in the making of this movie. Great, because there were no animals in this movie. I don't consider the Hellbees <laughs> to be an animal, but that is oh, our the- review of Hellraiser Four. That's it. That's that's the big uh, commentary, folks. Echo Bridge we... Home Entertainment, the entertainment alternative for what the world wants to see. I got that at the end of my DVD. Do you have that? I do not. Okay. No, mine ends abruptly. Oh, okay. So closing remarks about the film before we cut the uh, recording? Again, a valiant effort by all involved, given what they were dealt. I would say, like, I think the actors did a commendable job. I think the characters were all pretty damn well cast. You can see the intent. It's just, my God, is that film incoherent in terms of motivations. But hats off to Daniel for that score, because I think it's one of the biggest redeeming features that makes much of that film tolerable. Echo Bridge Techno, uh, uh, sorry, Echo Bridge Home Entertainment is responsible for probably for um, everything you might own in your filmography library, um, Lido, as well as mine, as they have in their portfolio twelve thousand titles. <laughs> Holy mackerel! Yes, including okay. some of, the, uh, including by the way, probably their biggest one. They, according to Wikipedia, their biggest one is probably Degrassi. <laughs> 
Wow. <laughs> Which, honestly, yeah, that is probably their biggest thing. DeGrassi is insanely popular, so. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Um, huge but, following, huge following. A huge following, huge following. Well, that is it for this episode of Film Dungeon Commentary. Lito, where can people find you if they want to uh, reach out to you or hire you for stuff? You can find me at litovelasco.com. I have a website there with um, pictures and, and video and some of my music. And you can find me on Instagram, of course, where you can find me under the name of litovelasco23. And then I'm also available on Twitter under the name of Hollywood Lito, and you can use the same name for YouTube as well. Excellent. And you can find me over on the Radio Horror Show, which I host every single Sunday night, WCW in Worcester, Massachusetts, or go to RadioHorror.wordpress.com, RadioHorror, and RadioHorror.com for more information about what's happening, what's coming up, what podcast I'm doing, or you can also order my graphic novel over on Amazon, Stitcher, uh, sorry, gra- uh, hmm, Facebook, um store amazon or etsy uh vlada a dracula tale or you can order the audio book which vlito Vle- Vle- ah, lito has music on yes there you go thank you everyone yeah. we'll be ba- i will be back with another episode of film dungeon commentary sooner than i realize coming up very soon for something really cool here on the radio horror network <laughs>